Thank you very much. Uh, it's an honor and a pleasure to be here uh, in this beautiful building uh, to hear such important uh, talks about such important research that's going on in Scotland and continues to go on. I'm going to speak to you about uh, youth mental health in families at high risk specifically um, and do so in regards to three particular conditions, uh, depression, bipolar disorder and schizophrenia, uh, that between them account for uh, depression is the most disabling condition affecting mankind, according to the World Health Organization, uh, and bipolar disorder and schizophrenia together are as common as dementia. So uh, they're common and important conditions that affect the young, and as a general adult psychiatrist and researcher, uh, those are the patients that I tend to look after uh, and, the, and the, the, the patients uh, in, into whose conditions and treatment I research. Um, so over the past... 20 years or so, just about everyone in the Department of Psychiatry has been involved in, in one or other of no less than three longitudinal cohort studies that we have done uh, and are at various stages of. I'm not going to mention uh, one in people at learning disability other than just to say that study continues and the, ra the rationale for that study is that people with an IQ of less than 70 have a four times increased risk of developing a psychotic illness uh, and that study uh, continues. Um, by way of background, as I've alluded to already, depression is a very common condition. 5% uh, of the population in most countries at any point in time will be depressed. Uh, so that's one in 20. So assuming that uh, you are a representative subsection of, of the general population, and uh, there's about 200 people here, that would be about 10 people in this audience at this particular point in time. Uh, the lifetime risk of depression is 20%. So one in five people at some stage will have uh, uh, depressive symptoms such that they are disabling and potentially responsive to treatment. Uh, bipolar disorder and schizophrenia, much less common, thankfully, but much more severe, so they can really blight lives, uh, especially if they are untreated. Um, and all these illnesses tend to come on when people are young, or cut down in their prime, or at least uh, disabled in their prime, and life made much more difficult than it already is in terms of uh, going through the processes of leaving home, getting education or training, get established in careers, developing one's own families, those, can, those problems, which uh, at times vex all of us, uh, are compounded when one has depression to deal with from an average age of late teens, bipolar disorder from an average age of 20, or schizophrenia from an average age of 25. Uh, the reason for studying these uh, people in a high familial risk context is that these conditions are all highly genetic. So the heritability, uh, which is the statistic that's used to describe the, the combination of gene and gene environment interaction that causes these conditions is about 40% for depression and as high as 70% for bipolar disorder and 80% for schizophrenia. So these are, are very important genetic conditions and we're making real progress, um, as David Porteous told you earlier, in terms of identifying the genes for these conditions and that will make it, uh, the, 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 that opens up all sorts of prospects for early identification, uh, treatment and potentially prevention. And that's really the focus of, of the next few slides I'm going to give you. Uh, to give you some advance warning, I'm going to ask you to do some question and answers in about three slides time, halfway through my talk. Um, and then I'm going to change tack slightly to some ongoing cohort studies that we've got going on. So um, contrary to some of the mythology about these conditions, they, they do tend to respond to treatment if people will actually uh, go and see someone and seek help and get help. There are all sorts of hurdles not least stigmatization and shame uh, that stop people doing that. But if people do get help, the vast majority of them respond to uh, psychotherapies or pharmacotherapies, whether it's depression, bipolar disorder, or schizophrenia. Uh, many people will need to carry on taking those treatments because they're not curative, just like the rest of medicine, really. Um, I hope I'm not giving away a trade secret, but most doctors do not cure many conditions. Uh, many people uh, have chronic diseases for which they need to carry on taking treatment. And it's just the same for depression, bipolar disorder, and schizophrenia. Uh, but the goal as a researcher uh, who is interested in clinical research, improving the lot of patients and, and multiply affected families, is developing ever better ways of detecting the illness or diagnosing it earlier, treating it better, and predicting response. So in the bipolar family study, which actually Andrew McIntosh very modestly uh, skipped over the fact that he actually started this study way back in 2004. We recruited 154 relatives, usually first-degree relatives, brothers, sisters, mothers, fathers, uh, of people with 
bipolar disorder and followed them up. Um, actually, it wasn't mothers and fathers because they were all under the age of 25. And so we followed up from around about the age of 20, saw them every two years. They had brain scans and blood tests. Um, and as you can see thus far, some 14 years on, uh, a whopping 39 people have developed major depressive disorder out of the relatives of the bipolar disorder. So the, having bipolar disorder genetic risk is a massive increased risk for depression as well as it is for bipolar disorder. Thus far, as you can see, fortunately from the perspective of the families, only four have developed bipolar disorder. And whilst we have some uh, preliminary brain imaging data that suggests we can predict who's going to get depression uh, with quite impressive accuracy, this study is a work in progress and we're currently collecting a fifth wave of data, more or less as we speak, uh, with some European funding to support that. And we're currently also trying to get consent from the participants in the study so that we can collect their follow-up information through routinely collected uh, healthcare data through linkage uh, through the Information Statistics Division of the Scottish Government. So I'm not going to talk about that other than to say that study is ongoing. Um, what I'm going to talk about mainly is this Edinburgh High Risk Study, um, which myself and my boss, uh, bosses at the time, Eve Johnson and David Owens, started in 1995. So now some 23 years later, we have what I think might be the final uh, word on this particular study. Uh, we uh, ascertain subjects by asking psychiatrists all around Scotland, do you have any patients with schizophrenia with other people in the family with schizophrenia? Uh, and, then we would, they would, and then they would ask the patients, are, they, are you willing to take part in research? Um, some of us would go all over Scotland to speak to these potential uh, participants in the study. And as you can see, 220 high, 229 high-risk subjects between the ages of 16 and 25 uh, were contacted, 162 of them provided some data, uh, and actually most of them stayed in remarkably good contact with us for up to six assessments at two yearly intervals. Um, and, uh, and during that time, 21 of them developed uh, a psychotic disorder. Actually, in all 21 cases, it proved to be schizophrenia. So that's a 13% risk in these multiply affected families, much higher than the overall 1% risk one would see in the general population. And to cut a long story short, we found very many predictors of schizophrenia in this cohort, but the, the strongest is by far, uh, and the most convenient, is by far a single structural MRI scan of the brain. Now you've seen some of these images that James showed you earlier. It's a very detailed picture of your brain anatomy, uh, which one can analyze in very many different ways. Um, and what we did uh, with a medical student uh, what, called Eleni Zergiani, was look at how a single structural MRI scan done on average two and a half years before people develop schizophrenia, how powerfully that could predict schizophrenia. And it, overall accuracy, as you can see there on the slide, was a pretty impressive 88%, uh, which actually takes a single structural MRI scan to predict schizophrenia uh, to, into the kind of same power as commonly used screening tests like uh, mammography for breast screening, various other sc cancer screening tests. So these are very encouraging statistics. Uh, but for the individuals concerned, the, the way the, the, the data fanned out was that in four of the 21 who went on to get schizophrenia, if we'd used this single scan as a diagnostic test, we'd have said to four of them, it's all right, uh, you're not going to get schizophrenia, but they actually would have gone on to get it. So four false negatives. And that could potentially be very concerning uh, or even uh, disabling information uh, or might have had all sorts of adverse impacts um, the, on the people concerned. So we did, a, we did the same test again, this time adding in two of the best clinical predictors of schizophrenia, uh, memory impairment, uh, a subtle uh, impairment in terms of memory performance on a particular test, and also a personality questionnaire uh, asking for people's, um, if they'd had unusual experiences, sh like seeing things or hearing things, but short of the classic hallucinations or delusions that you would see in schizophrenia. And by combining those two pieces of information with the scan, we got an overall accuracy of the test, 94%, which is really pretty amazing. And we've since replicated this algorithm in a completely independent test set of data from Basel, in another clinical population where it doesn't perform quite so well, it performs overall around about 
But we have here the beginnings of technology, a proof of concept, if you like, where we could, in principle, use brain imaging to predict sometimes very major or severe mental illnesses, um, like depression, as I've alluded to, like schizophrenia, as I've shown you. And the, but I think it, also, it, offers, it, it opens up all sorts of interesting ethical questions. Would you, as a relatively healthy 21-year-old, want to know that you have an 88 or a 94% chance of developing schizophrenia in two and a half years' time? What would you do with that information if you did have a brain scan and you got a risk quotient back? So those did actually, together with some medical students uh, about a few years ago who are now doctors, I, I hope, and all aspiring psychiatrists, I hope even more, uh, we asked them to access their friends on Facebook. And we got about 400 responses from the friends of medical students on Facebook. So I won't pretend for any minute that this is necessarily a representative sample of anything. But anyway, 400 people, uh, and they, we, we asked them slightly different but related questions. So at what stage of risk, and we're talking in the context of schizophrenia here, would you consider having a brain scan that could be diagnostic? And 67%, two-thirds, said that just if they knew there were an increased risk for familial uh, reasons, or perhaps because they smoked cannabis on a regular basis or whatever it might be. And then a substantial minority uh, would only take it if they were, a, 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 would take it even if they were a, a, a population risk, and 19% said never at all. Um, and then the, the next question was, was we asked, um, well, of the 400, at what percentage level of risk of schizophrenia might you consider taking pre-symptomatic treatment? Now, we didn't specify whether that would be a talking treatment or a drug treatment, and people's responses might differ slightly according to those scenarios. But as you can see here, about a quarter of the population who responded to this entirely unrepresentative survey said, uh, I would only take treatment uh, for schizophrenia if I actually had it, not before the condition was manifest. But as you can see, that below those levels of risk, uh, the response is pretty evenly spread all the way down to you know, very low levels of risk. So there is a there's roughly speaking 10 to 15% of the population, uh, Facebook friends of medical students, who would consider taking a treatment uh, to reduce their risk of schizophrenia if it was just very slightly elevated amongst the over a background population risk. Okay, so we have ongoing studies uh, addressing psychosis, which is a, a word used to describe both bipolar disorder and schizophrenia, looking at uh, developing these brain imaging technologies across the EU in SciScan study, and across Scotland in the U.S. study, and we've been doing a couple of treatment trials uh, of minocycline for early schizophrenia, um, and now through this MRC consortium strata, which uh, I'll go over in the next couple of slides, we are trying to use brain imaging to predict response to treatment uh, and develop a new treatment uh, with colleagues across the U.K., now, before we got involved in this MRC Stratified Medicine Consortium, we, we unusually asked patients with schizophrenia and, uh, and their carers, what do you think about these kind of research studies? Uh, so this is true participatory research, because actually the responses we got did influence what we did. Um, and so one carer, this is an illustrative quote, but many other people said the same thing or alluded to the same thing, and it was completely counterintuitive and unexpected for us, was the one carer said that she, she her, her relative that we were uh, continue, considering asking to take part in the study, wouldn't have been able to cooperate in thinking skills tests like that at all. She wouldn't have the staying power or the coordination because of the drugs she'd been taking. And it was a common theme across the patients and the carers that we spoke to that they would actually prefer to have a brain scan than do pen and paper tests of their memory and attention because that often made them feel a bit stupid whereas as lying, back, lying back and thinking of Scotland in the scanner didn't present any kind of similar hurdles. And uh, about scans specifically, uh, a, a service user, someone with schizophrenia, said, despite the inconvenience, I would take part in this research because I could see how it might benefit not me personally but others in the future. And I think you've all expressed those opinions already today in one way or shape or form, and just by being here, uh, you're obviously of that mindset. Um, so with this information, we got money from the MRC ourselves and, and, and colleagues from four other centers across the UK, and we tried to use these brain scamming technologies to predict people in the earliest phases of schizophrenia, and in particular trying to detect treatment-resistant res schizophrenia. So about two-thirds of people respond reasonably well to antipsychotics in schizophrenia, uh, but a third just do not. And identifying that third would be very useful uh, information in terms of 
giving them particular treatments, um, potentially. Uh, but we used, we, we, did, we addressed this question, can we predict treatment resistant schizophrenia from elevated glutate, glutamate levels in brain scans uh, in 20 subjects uh, each in five different centers, and we couldn't. So that was an expensive uh, failure, if you like, but it's, it's not a failure because we now know that, that glutamate, at least in the parts of the brain we mentioned it, does not predict treatment-resistant schizophrenia. But on the back of that study, through a, co a collaboration with the drug company Lundbeck, who are based in Copenhagen, and very much uh, with the favor of the Medical Research Council, we are currently trialing a new antipsychotic drug which works in a slightly different way to traditional antipsychotic drugs for people in the early stages of schizophrenia. Um, and they go through a, this is a particular type of cohort study, uh, which sometimes people forget about. Uh, randomized controlled trials, clinical trials, are a particular type of cohort study where people get uh, preferably randomly assigned to one treatment or another, and it's the gold standard method of detecting whether a treatment works or not in, in medicine. And uh, for that reason, it's a particularly important subtype of, of cohort study. And so we're now embarked on this, where patients will have a three-week screening period, then be treated with the experimental drug or a, a antipsychotic called risperidone or olanzapine for 14 weeks, and then followed up for a few more weeks. And that study we're currently recruiting to, I suspect no one in the audience are in a position to take part, even if you wish to, uh, but I thought I'd draw your attention to the fact that this is uh, an ongoing study uh, addressing an important uh, area in schizophrenia research um, and an example of a particular type of cohort study. So, uh, in conclusion, uh, clinically relevant brain imaging is very much on the horizon, uh, not just for the early diagnosis of psychosis. I could have shown you similar data for depression or indeed for dementia. Uh, but these technological advances raise all sorts of ethical and practical considerations, um, which I think have been largely unaddressed uh, by researchers thus far. And so we are making slow but tentative steps to address those, lang those, uh, those knowledge gaps, and you've actually contributed substantially to uh, that this afternoon just by answering those two questions in those surveys. And the search for ever better treatments and predictors of response and resistance in psychiatry, uh, as in the rest of medicine, continues. So thank you very much for your attention.